Hello, it's Scott Manley here. As you may have heard by now, India's attempt to land a spacecraft on the moon didn't go according to plan. This was part of the Chandrayaan-2 mission, which was a very ambitious mission. Originally, it started planning uh, back in the, you know, the, in the noughties. They were actually going to have an orbiter, which was going to look for lunar resources. It was planned to have a very high-resolution camera, even better than the one NASA has on board the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And they were going to have a lander, which was built, going to be built by the Russians, except that at some point they decided to change their mind and build their own lander. This lander is called Vikram, and the plan was to land it on the surface of the moon yesterday. The launch of the spacecraft on India's geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle happened back in July, but the way that it got to the moon, it took a while because it was using a very low power engine for deep space maneuvers. This, of course, is to save mass, but that meant that every maneuver had to occur at perigee, so that it very slowly lifted its uh, apogee up until it got captured by the moon. Similarly, it took several revolutions before it slowed itself into a low enough orbit that the Vikram lander could detach itself and begin its descent towards the surface. Last night, uh, the lander was in a 100 km by 30 km orbit, and its task was to descend towards the South Pole, a place where no spacecraft has landed so, so far, and therefore we were quite interested. Now, the live stream on uh, Istro's uh, YouTube channel, well, I'm going to say it was pretty terrible because the producer kept on cutting away to pictures of people rather than the pictures of the screens in the background. I have actually edited out all the pictures of people with no displays in the background. And I think of the 10 minute descent, we got like two minutes of actual interesting data. I mean, as live stream of moon landing go, this is obviously way better than what China offers us, but it pales in comparison to the masses of technical data that was on display when Bereshit was making its ill-fated descent towards the lunar surface. But I'm not implying that these are correlated, I just would like to see more information so that we can actually get an idea and see what's going on and be sure rather than trying to read the reaction on the faces of various people. Thankfully, this wasn't the only information source. There were live tel radio telescope traces being made available by, well, space nerds. Uh, and, you know, you can see the carrier signal there that was used to communicate with the deep space network. And as the deceleration started, you can actually see it turn up. That is the Doppler shift changing over time. Now, this is sort of a proxy for the velocity, and it will be important later on. As this was understandably a big deal for India, the country's president, Narendra Modi, was there in his observation booth, being pointed at and pointing at things, doing everything that a president can do to really help a spacecraft land on the moon. Initially, the descent actually worked pretty well. The first phase was the rough braking phase. It was run for about 10 minutes, and this was mostly taking away the 1,600 meters of orbital velocity. The spacecraft was about one and a half tons initially, about 60% of that was fuel. It had five main engines and eight uh, steering engines. The main engines were 800 Newton uh, bipropellant hypergolic thrusters. Now, they were arranged in a cross shape with a, the one in the center was to be left only for landing. After about four and a half minutes, we start to see the uh, trajectory begin to curve down. At this point, of course, it's not moving fast enough for us orbital speed to counteract the force of gravity and it starts to pull it to get uh, pulled down and accelerate towards the surface. At this point, yeah, you can see on that right screen it's moving at about one kilometer per second with a desync rate of about 32 meters per second. So I'm going to skip things forward. This is actually going to synchronize. On the right, we have the radio telescope trace. On the left, we have the live stream. And that's, of course, important because we keep cutting away from useful information like this to the less useful information of people applauding. It's about to hit the end of the rough braking phase, and you can see they turned on the imager data download. We never saw any imagery. I th there was the center screen said it was waiting for live imagery, but I don't think we ever actually saw any imagery appear. Also note the orientation, that's the uh, third from the left. That does something weird in a minute as well. Now, this is where it's switching from the rough braking phase into the proper landing phase. It's still running on these four engines. 
But because, of course, there's a significant delay in terms of signal from the Earth to the Moon, this is entirely automated. The spacecraft has a number of cameras and a laser altimeter. It has like hazard avoidance cameras. It has a camera that's supposed to determine its uh, you know, ground speed. And um, so it's going to take all that information, distill it down, and then try to figure out where it should land so that it doesn't actually hit anything uh, big or hard or just simply land too fast. Now, you'll notice a slight kink on the right there in terms of the lander velocity. Watch the descent trajectory here. It starts to deviate. It's been perfectly on this red line all the way down. And... I don't know, it's about now that it starts to take this uh, trip sideways. I'm not really clear exactly why this happens, but I think what happens is the spacecraft starts to lose uh, orientation. It starts to tumble with the engines running. And the, as it tumbles, that means the acceleration vector is no longer pointing directly up away from the surface. Its engines are at some point pointing towards space. It looks like it's actually accelerating downwards here, but that could actually simply be the force of lunar gravity. And about now, we cut away and we see the lander is upside down. And, and I was like, why couldn't we have seen that for the last 30 seconds? I would have really loved to see the orientation. Now, according to official data, official reports, they lost telemetry at two kilometers. But it looks like we're still getting updates. And there's definitely still signal coming from the spacecraft According to the descent trajectory, it is going straight down. That may be extrapolated from the last good data they have. But right now, the signal stops completely on the right. And that's probably the surest sign that the spacecraft got destroyed. It probably hit the moon going about 100 meters per second or thereabouts. And, well, uh, there would be chunks of stuff left. And we might actually get to see that on future uh, orbits. I mentioned that the orbiter Chandrayaan-2 has a camera which has a 0.32 meter resolution. We also have the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter which is going to be uh, passing over that site in a couple of weeks. So I'm hoping that we actually get to see some debris. There's also the possibility that one of the experiments actually survived because there were a re was, was a, a laser retroreflector on there. And that isn't an active experiment. It's a passive piece of hardware that just kind of reflects light back. It would be kind of interesting to see if that survives. So what probably happened? Uh, I mean, the good news is that the orbiter is still working and the orbiter had the bulk of scientific hardware. There were a few experiments certainly on the lander, but uh, it wasn't anywhere near as fancy as the orbiter. So based on the information we have, it's actually really hard to speculate with any certainty about the, what actually went wrong. It appeared to me the spacecraft started tumbling. Why did this happen? It could have been a switch of the program uh, that caused it to perhaps perform an, uh, an adverse maneuver. It could have been an engine failure. It could have been something could have just broken and it could have started tumbling out of control and lost signal with the surface. Uh, playing it back again, I, I don't know what that was going upside down, and it would be really nice if someone from uh, Israel would come forward and tell us what that was, whether that was simulated, whether that was extrapolated from readings. It looked actually like it rotated upside down and then stopped rotating right at the end, as if that was good information, but that was exactly when contact was lost. Whereas the good data that we have on the right, that shows that we have uh, an acceleration towards the surface, but it does seem to recover and start accelerating back you know, in the direction there was, although the deceleration doesn't seem to be as high, as powerful as it was prior to this. Uh, and then, of course, it hits the surface. It runs out of time to stop. I'm not sure whether it flipped around upside down and then was in a situation where it couldn't recover I mean, from two kilometers up, descending at 60 meters per second, the spacecraft had more than enough thrust to weight ratio to slow its descent to a stop before hitting the surface. But it's entirely possible the spacecraft, after flipping upside down, thought it was at a different altitude and was transmitting that back and then, of course, smacked into the surface. That, of course, sounds a lot like the Schiaparelli lander, which, due to high rates of spin and rotation after a parachute deployment, it was confused by its altitude, cut its parachute, and landed on the surface at very high velocities. Spacecraft are very complicated. The moon is hard. But, you know, to their credit, they did hit the moon going at a slower speed than Israel's Bereshit did. 
Uh, regardless, you know, getting this far, they deserve a lot of credit for getting so close and not quite making it. They still have a, an exceptionally good spacecraft in lunar orbit, and I'm sure they're going to be looking at Chandrayaan-3, which was going to be a collaboration with Japan, but it's entirely possible that they decide to refocus their efforts on their human spaceflight program. Uh, best of luck to ISRO in the future. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.